but we welcome you this evening to our midweek Bible study of our new work here in Huntsville, Alabama, which we call uh, Forward Christian Life Center. And uh, I think you're going to be real excited about the Bible studies that we're going to be sharing with you over the course of, I would dare say, probably at least the, ne the next eight or ten weeks. Um, as promised, we are going to be looking specifically at uh, passages that relate to our LGBT affirming theology. Um, it is our position that um, Bible passages that have commonly been used in condemnation and criticism of, uh, and demonizing for that matter, of the LGBT community uh, and of LGBT people. Uh, have been misinterpreted and misunderstood. And uh, so therefore, we're going to be looking at these passages over the next couple of months, one by one. And uh, I think that if you're an individual who has struggled with your identity as an LGBT person and a Christian, these will be helpful to you. If you are not an LGBT person, then uh, these studies are going to be extremely helpful to you as well. Because, as I have said on many, many occasions, when we understand something wrong, that means there is an opportunity uh, for something important that we ought to understand, uh, and, and that is missing. So it's imperative if we're going to have a truthful understanding of the Word of God, then it's important that we understand what it is really saying. And... Um, you know, a lot of times people think, you know, well, this study, you know, it only affects LGBT people, you know. This doesn't have anything to do with me. Oh, yes, it does. And I think you'll be surprised when you see how that it does, in fact, have something to do with you. And uh, uh, so it's extremely important, you know, it people just take the Word of God far too um, casually. You have got to approach it with reverence. You have got to approach it with respect. You have got to be willing um, to see what is really said and what is really meant, and to understand what the Lord is trying to say to the church. And, um, you know, a lot of people kind of take the approach that, uh, well, you know, bless God, the Word of God is perfectly clear on this issue. You know, it's perfectly clear. Yeah, it's perfectly clear on a whole lot of issues. The only problem is it's funny how on some issues where it's perfectly clear, people in the church want to ignore it. Mm -hmm. And yet in other areas where it's so-called perfectly clear, they are willing to accept it at face value. The only problem is we are reading a document, and I know Baptists hate it when you say this, because in their stupidity, and I'm sorry, I, I just have to say it the way I feel it, people. In the stupidity and in the ignorance of Baptist thinking, uh, they create all kinds of scenarios 
that are unscriptural, that have no basis whatsoever in the Word of God, and, uh, and they preach them as absolute fact and truth. And one of the areas where, and when I say Baptist, I don't mean exclusively the Southern Baptist Convention, although that is who I am primarily speaking of, but there are actually other denominations and other groups that really share in this same mindset, okay? But the Southern Baptist Convention kind of leads the fight, you know. Uh, but there, there are certain things that are taught within their circles which have no, no foundation in the Word of God whatsoever, have no foundation and truth whatsoever, uh, but they teach it as absolute fact. One of those things, for instance, being that the King James translation is, in effect, a divinely authored translation, and that the King James translators were anointed of the Holy Ghost to translate, whereas other translators from other versions were not. And uh, this is a position, folks, that's taken by a number of denominations and groups. And uh, they have no, there's no way in the world you can say that that is scriptural. There's no way in the world you can say that that is a fact. The reality is the King James translation uh, is actually a compilation of a number of other translations. They actually took segments from other translations and compiled it uh, into the King James translation. And so they borrowed a lot from other that, uh, uh, translations that already existed at that time. And so not only did they borrow from other translations, but then, of course, there were certain scriptures and certain passages in certain areas where they did do, and I believe with all my heart, and I have to believe, that the men that uh, were involved in the translation were serious. Uh, they were godly men who wanted to do justice by the word of God. However, as one famous rabbi that I have studied in the course of my studies, uh, one rabbi said, and uh, it, it almost sounds a little vulgar, but it's really not, you know, if you just take it and understand what he's saying. But he made the comment once that trying to understand the Hebrew Scriptures uh, based on any translation, he said, I don't care what language it's translated into, I don't care who does the translation. He said, trying to understand the Hebrew scriptures based upon any translation is like uh, trying to nurse a baby through a sweater. You can only get so much, you know, there, there's only so much you can pull through because in reality, the Hebrew tongue is probably, I believe, probably the most complex language used uh, among humans. And I believe this is why God used Hebrew. I believe this is why the Lord chose this language and these people because their language is so complex. When the Lord says something, there it's never really open for debate. You can debate, and, and this is something you can learn in studying the Hebrew, the uh, Jewish religion and Jewish rabbis, and what they'll explain to you is, the text always says what it says. And it's, it is pretty succinct and it is pretty clear. But where the Hebrew um, rabbis of old differed in opinion was not in the translation, what it said. No, none of them could ever 
change what it says. But there were those who would read what it said, and in effect they would add to or they would take away from. And the, they would do that in terms of application. So what it says, it says. But how is this applied? And that is where you would get differences of opinions um, between various ancient rabbis and, um, and even modern rabbis. You know, that's where you get the difference of opinion. Uh, but Hebrew is a very succinct and clear language. So there really should not be any misunderstanding as to what is said. The problem is in the evangelical, especially in the evangelical and fundamentalist communities, you have those like the Southern Baptist Convention who erroneously, falsely try to set forth that the King James translation in particular is divinely appointed, you know, and therefore it is to be read and understood word for word exactly as it reads. That, that's idiotic. That is so stupid. The whole notion of that is beyond stupid. It, it's, it's, it's hideously idiotic. Say, Pastor, why do you say that? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the English language is an evolving language. And the English language today is not what the English language was back in the 16th century. And many of the words that we read in the uh, King James Bible today have modern meanings in some cases that are virtually opposite to what we read in the King James. I mentioned a couple weeks ago on Sunday as the call to worship, I read one of my favorite passages from the Psalms, uh, Psalm 47. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with a voice of triumph, for the Lord Most High is terrible. Well, when we say something is terrible, we're implying something very negative. We're, we're saying that it's awful, that, you know, that uh, it's beyond that, you know. But the King James, the word that the King James is translating from the Greek literally means awe-inspiring. So again, they're using an old usage of the term terror. See, when we say terror, again, we mean connotation negative. In their era, when they said, like for instance, oh, the king, the king strikes terror, you know, in the hearts of his followers, that doesn't mean that the people were terrified, they were scared of the king. No, it meant they were in awe of the king. Do you see what I'm saying? So there was a very different usage then. So even though their translation is not inaccurate for their time, but as the language has evolved and changed, now we have any number of words that have taken on a very new and different meaning, okay? So, therefore, to try to read the King James translation as though it can just be read at face value and taken at face value uh, is really a very ignorant and foolish and unlearned uh, approach to studying the Word of God. I say all the time, when people try to come at me with the attitude, any church that accepts gay people and believes gay people are on equal footing with everybody else in the church, you know, they're just twisting and perverting the word of God. They're just, you know, blah, blah, blah. and that that is, it, folks, I got people that come at me like that almost every day of the week. And... I literally laugh at them. 
literally. <laughs> because I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, you ignorant pile of stuff, I'm going to be nice today. You ignorant people, you foolish and ignorant people. I've spent years, years investigating these matters. You haven't spent five minutes. You have listened to what preachers have preached. And if you're a preacher, you have not only listened to what other preachers have preached, but you've re-preached it. You just keep regurgitating all the same foul, false information that you've been fed. And you know, you know, you're like a bird. The mother bird eats the food and partially digests it, and then she feeds it to her babies, okay? You're regurgitating the same crap that you've been fed into those who are under you. How do I know this? Because sadly, I have to confess that for uh, the first part of my ministry, I did the same identical thing probably in any number of areas. And there are so many falsehoods that are just passed down and people accept them as absolute fact and they never take the time to investigate. And this is why the church, this is why America, this is why our theology is in the mess it's in today because too many people have taken too many issues and they have been too careless in examining those issues. So the reality is uh, a church like ours that is LGBT affirming, we are LGBT affirming not by being more careless and by handling the word of God with less uh, sobriety and intention and, and care, but rather the exact opposite, because we've taken the time to look into matters and investigate matters that others just don't want to be bothered with. They read it, they think that, that based on uh, a passive reading of a new, uh, uh, an English translation of a Hebrew or a Greek text, they think they can understand exactly what God was saying and exactly what God meant. Well, you know what? I'm not afraid to stand before God in the judgment in the least. I was on my deathbed in 2000, and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, Do you want to come home or do you want to stay? He said, Do you want to come home? <laughs> The Lord used the term, do you want to come home? Didn't ask me if I wanted to die. He said, do you want to come home? Or do you want to stay? I'm not afraid to stand before God in the judgment because I've taken the time and made the effort to examine these things. And for years after I first came out, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't even try to re-examine them, literally, because I have been so conditioned growing up in church to be fearful of these passages. I was absolutely convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt that these passages condemn me to a devil's hell and that if I examined them more closely, I was just going to draw the same conclusion because if there's anything about this preacher, I don't know about other preachers, I don't know about other Christians, but I know about this guy right here. If there's anything about this guy. I grew up in a church where they taught me that the absolute final authority was the Word of God. And I still believe the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And I still believe the word of God is the only singular source for God's people. I don't believe the Pearl of Great Price. I don't believe the Book of Mormon. I don't believe any of these other documents offer a, a, a child of God anything. But I believe the Word of God is our singular source 
for truth and for doctrine and instruction. And so when the Lord finally convinced me that I needed to investigate these passages more carefully, I approached my study very trepidatiously, let's say it that way. I was not running into it. I, I walked into it very slowly and very carefully. But as I began to look at some of these passages, and I began to, and a lot of times you see clues in the passage itself that if you're a thinking person, you're going to say, now, well, wait a minute. You know, how, how, I don't quite understand why it would be said like this. And that is where you kind of get a, uh, a, a, a starting place for deeper study. Okay, so if, if you read something like we're going to start tonight, um, if you read something and you say, hmm, wait a minute, something about that just doesn't quite mesh, it doesn't quite click, then you're able to say, well, you know what, if, if that doesn't quite click, why doesn't it click? Well, it doesn't click because according to this, this was all men doing this. So why would, why would Lot offer his daughters if it was all men coming after Lot? You know, and they're supposed to be homosexual and papa, and we're going to get into it in a moment. So then you say, okay, well, where it uses the word men in, the, in Genesis 19, maybe you need to go back into the Hebrew and investigate that. And then when you start going back into the Hebrew and investigating and doing a little word study and doing a little etymology, history of the word, all of a sudden, it just blows up. All of a sudden, it becomes so clear, it's not even funny. And all of a sudden, the whole story makes perfect sense, whereas beforehand, there were any number of areas where you might, if you gave it any thought at all, you might actually stop and pause for a minute and say, well, I'm not sure quite why this, I'm not quite sure why that, you know. And, but when you actually dig a little, when you go back into the Hebrew, when you go back into the Greek, then you gain a much clearer understanding. All of a sudden, everything makes perfect sense. And you understand what the Lord was really trying to say. And when you understand oftentimes what the Lord was really trying to say, all of a sudden now, a passage that you were applying in one way, erroneously, has a very different but very important application in an entirely different way. And for decades and centuries, the church has missed out on applying it in the proper way and instead, they've been misapplying it in the improper way. And guess what? The whole time, the very thing it's condemning is never addressed. The very thing that it is, in fact, telling us to avoid and telling us not to do, uh, we are never talking about. Okay? All right. So, we're going to start tonight with our LGBT uh, clobber passage series and um, I was thinking and praying and talking to the Lord and I said Lord I'm not sure which passage would be best to begin with uh, but it came to me that I really think that the probably the best and, and what will get you on the hook so to speak what will really get your interest and help you to understand what I'm talking about tonight uh, is Genesis 19 and the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Not because it is the most important passage or, you know, uh, anything of that sort, 
but rather because it is the most commonly misused passage. And if there is anything that LGBT people are hit over the head with, uh, if people don't know their Bible worth anything, they're going to try to use the story of Sodom and Gomorrah as a way of condemning wholesale LGBT people. So we're going to begin with this and then we'll move on. It'll probably take us a couple, three weeks to get through this passage, folks, because there's a lot of meat here, okay? All right, so let us go first to the Lord in prayer tonight as we begin our study. Father, we love you, God, and we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity you've given us today to delve into the Word of God. You have called us to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. We ask, Lord, today that the anointing and the touch of the Holy Ghost would be present. Help us, Lord, to speak the truth to articulate the truth, and to hear the truth. Many, Lord, even in the LGBT community, have been so poisoned by perverted understandings and manipulations of this passage that even when they hear the truth, they will try to reject it and rebel against it. The enemy wants them to believe false information. He wants them, Lord, to believe that there is no hope of heaven, that there's no sense in trying to live for God, because in the end they're going to lose out anyway. And Master, in the name of Jesus, we come against the spirit of false theology, the spirit of false teaching. We come against false understandings and misconceptions and misinterpretations. And Master, in the name of Jesus, we ask that by the Holy Ghost, you would open our hearts, our minds, our soul today to receive from the Word of God that which the Spirit of the Lord would attempt to impart at this hour. We ask it all in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. There is the story in Genesis 19 of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And there were also a couple more sister cities. It's kind of like the Twin Towers in New York City. A lot of people don't realize the World Trade Center complex consisted of a lot more than the North and South Towers. Those were the most visible. Those were the largest. But there were a number of other buildings. As a matter of fact, on 9-11, those other buildings also went down, which is part of the reason there's so much uh, theory about how that all really happened. Because there were other structures, smaller, uh, less well-known, that were still part of the World Trade Center um, area that also went down on 9-11. Well, the same is true of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah were not the only cities destroyed, but the other cities are hardly ever even mentioned or spoken of. They're referred to in, in a, a general manner as the cities of the plain. And so there were actually, in reality, a few more cities that got destroyed with Sodom and Gomorrah. But the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is probably the most commonly used story in trying to condemn uh, LGBT people in a wholesale fashion. Before I even read it, let me make a, a, an important point. One of the funny... Not haha -ha funny, but ignorance funny aspects of the use of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah lies in the fact that um, it is presented as this is proof 
that homosexuality is a far greater evil, you know, a much greater wickedness than any other sin. Well, first of all, that whole idea is unscriptural. That whole idea conflicts with the law of Moses. And uh, thirdly, there is nowhere in the law of Moses, listen carefully to me now, any Hebrew scholar will tell you this is a fact. There is nowhere in the law of Moses where homosexuality is condemned. Immediately people say, oh no, you're forgetting Leviticus, you know. No, I'm not. We're going to get there. The reality is the law of Moses condemned one specific sexual type of act. One. Ask any rabbi, did the law of Moses say, and you know, um, um, thou shalt not uh, engage in any sexual activity whatsoever under any circumstances with a member of the same gender? No, didn't say that, not at all. First of all, talk to any Jewish rabbi, they'll tell you, Ladies, you somehow or another escaped the entire uh, issue. There's nowhere in the law that says women can't be with women. Nowhere. Doesn't say that. There's nowhere in the law that says that homosexuality is unnatural. As a matter of fact, that according to many of the Jewish Teachers and rabbis that I've studied, they say, no, <laughs> quite the opposite. We understand you put men in prison where they don't have access to women. At some point, they get horn doggled up enough, they're going to start going after each other because it's natural to just try to find a way to work off your steam, so to speak, okay? And this is why, because of certain uh, prohibitions within the law, this is why the ancient rabbis who create the additional documents that are used in the Hebrew faith, see, they have the Torah, but then they also have the ancient rabbis who have written about the Torah. It's kind of like a Bible commentary, and they use these Bible commentaries, these ancient writings of the ancient rabbis, they use them as much as they use the Torah in explaining the Torah and in describing the application for what is read in the Torah, and oftentimes these ancient rabbis set forth ideas of, well, since God says he doesn't want people doing this, then you really need to avoid this situation here. Because if you don't avoid this situation here, it might lead to this. And again, because we have a church full of people who are just as ignorant as a brick and really don't know their head from a hole in the ground, but they think they know everything. Because they don't understand any of this at all that I'm talking about, then they miss out on very important truths, even in reading the New Testament. There's one passage in the New Testament that is extremely interesting to a Jewish reader, especially one who is... Um, very conservative and sticks to the uh, teachings of the ancient rabbis. Um, and that is uh, where Jesus talks about at his return, he said, two men shall be lying in one bed. Why would two men be lying in one bed? Why? That, that doesn't even make any sense. Secondly, according to the ancient uh, Jewish rabbis, 
This is not permissible. Two men should not be lying in the same bed. has nothing to do with whether or not there's sexual activity going on. It has to do with, if they are, then illicit activity might then go on. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's sort of a preventative thing, all right? And so uh, when the Lord said two men shall be lying in one bed, and then he said one shall be taken and the other shall be left, there's a lot of implication in that statement. But because we're dealing with a church full of evangelical uh, fundamentalist people who only want to take the black and white in front of them, and they don't want to spend any time doing any real work or any real effort, then uh, they miss out on meaning in other passages as well, okay? They totally miss out. All right, so is there any such thing as a greater sin? No, there is not. No, there is not. According to the law of Moses, if you were guilty of one single infraction, did not matter the nature. You know, one of the things fundamentalists and evangelicals love to do, when you come back at them and say, well, but the law also condemned eating shellfish, and the law also condemned this and that, and they'll say, oh, but that was ceremonial law. Um, no, wrong. Wrong as wrong can be. God did not divide the law into ceremonial law and religious law and secular law. No, the law that God gave Moses and the law as the Jewish people understand it is the law, period, end of story. But you see, in order to justify themselves in doing one thing that the law condemns, they try to separate it as though, well, ceremonial law was one thing, and religious law was another. Baloney. Baloney. No. A Jewish person who does not keep kosher has broken every commandment in the law according to the word of God, according to the law of Moses. And a Jewish person who commits adultery has broken every commandment in the law. They've broken every rule of Torah. And so there is absolutely nowhere in the Word of God, nowhere where sin is described in degrees. And this again is important to our understanding. This again is so important to we believers uh, in understanding the entire message of salvation. It doesn't matter how good a person you are. It doesn't matter if you're the most wonderful person on the planet. The reality is to break one rule is to break all of them. Mm -hmm. That's why we all need to be saved. That is why it is impossible for any individual to earn salvation on the basis of works. Because in God's eyes, one transgression is no greater nor smaller than the other transgression. So when they try to make out like one transgression is greater than the other, now you create a theology where people believe in the church as well as out of the church that there are certain things they can do that aren't so bad. And that is not true. Do you follow what I'm saying? So you see how important it is to keep everything in the proper context and, and to represent it correctly? Okay, so now... Uh, Let me do something real quick here. Oh. That's what it is. I, I hate it when I, I can't think of a word. 
the ancient rabbis, the, the, what you hear uh, referred to as the Talmud, is the writings of the ancient rabbis. That is the, uh, the uh, biblical commentary, you might say, on the law. And usually the, the Jews, if they're not quoting the Torah, they're quoting the Talmud, okay? And it's in the Talmud, for instance, where two men are not, not only are they not to lie together in a bed, they're not even to travel together without a third person present. Two men are not to be in a field alone, working. Why? Because homosexuality is, a, it is unnatural and no, the opposite. Because they see it as being far too easy for two human beings who are left alone for any period of time in virtually any setting to be tempted to engage in something of an act that maybe they ought not to be engaged in, okay? Think Brokeback Mountain, okay? All right? So, uh, so you have the Torah and then you have the Talmud. I, I couldn't think of the word Talmud and it was driving me crazy. So I wanted to look it up real quick. Genesis 19, and there came two angels to Sodom at even, or in the evening, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and he said, Behold, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young. Now listen to the next phrase. All the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now we will deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut to the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. Now I'm going to read something to you real quick. I'm going to continue for a minute. Really, that's as far as I want to go is verse 10. But I want you to remember, Lot tries to appease these people by saying, I have daughters who have not known men. That was the lie. That was a complete lie, a fabrication. How do we know? Verse 11. I mean, I'm sorry, verse 12. We wanted to read through verse 11. Verse 12 says, And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law, and thy sons and thy daughters, 
and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law. Lot only had two daughters. If he has sons-in-law, that's plural. That means each daughter had a husband, which married his daughters and said, Up, oh, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. So right there, I'm trying to give you a, a real fast example. Right there, you immediately have a conflict just within the text as it is read. That should make any thinking person now say, well, then why would Lot create the lie, I have daughters who are still virgins, who are unmarried, why would he <laughs> offer to throw his daughters claiming their virgins out to these people that have surrounded his house when they're supposed to be a bunch of homosexuals? What on stinking earth, what interest would they have in Lot's daughters to begin with? But why did Lot claim they were virgins. There has to have been a reason. Somehow their being virgins would have made them more attractive, would have made them more appealing to these people, right? You would think, again, I'm just talking about use your brains, people. Don't just read something and, and just wash over it. Read it, read it, read it. If you see something that appears to conflict, if you see something that doesn't quite mesh, that means you might want to do a little more careful study. Because in doing a little more careful study, guess what? All of these elements are going to come together. All of these things are going to make sense, okay? All right, so... It's important to understand, first of all, that the story of Sodom does not begin in Genesis 19. The story of Sodom, in fact, begins in the previous chapter, in Genesis chapter 18. It is in Genesis chapter 18 that we see, let me see here, there we go. It's in Genesis chapter 18 that we see uh, the visitation of these men as well as what appears to be an a, 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 a manifestation of God himself appearing to Abraham and explaining to Abraham, we're on our way to Sodom. And the reason we're on our way to Sodom is uh, the reputation of this uh, community, these cities, has reached heaven. And the Lord has sent us. We are going to investigate to see if it is exactly as we understand it to be. Now, listen. God is God. He knows the end from the beginning. The Bible said there's nothing that can be hid from him. So therefore, is God sitting a trillion miles away in heaven waiting for reports? No. There is something to be gleaned from this, even this aspect of the story. And that is, number one, God is not quick to destroy. Neither does he rush to judgment. Are these not very words we read in the book of Psalms, for instance? 
that God does not rush to judgment. He does not rush to destroy. No. You see, we have people who love to try to make God look more like them instead of them working hard to look more like the Lord. And they try to say, well, you know, God just, he sees this garbage boy and he just wants to smash it out. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. Mm -mm. He gives every opportunity. He gives every chance in the world. In this instance, what he in effect was doing was saying, I'm going to send representatives who appear as men. Let me see how this city deals with these men. Why? Because you're going to find out shortly that the very sins that Sodom uh, was guilty of <coughs> involved their treatment of those who were travelers and those who passed through their community. This was, this was the biggest part of their sin. So that explains why God would send men or those angels that appeared as men into this city as travelers because, okay, they've got a reputation of treating people who pass through their communities a certain way, I'm going to send my angels and let's see how they treat these men. You follow? Okay. So now, the truth of the matter is before these men ever arrived, the cities were already slated for destruction. The Lord informed Abraham, that the cities were going to be destroyed, didn't he? And Abraham interceded and said, if there's so many righteous, if there's so many righteous, if there, and I've always said one of the interesting points of that conversation between Abraham and the Lord is, Abraham knew Lot was there. He knew Lot's wife was there. He knew Lot's two daughters were there. These were, this was Abraham's nephew and his great nieces. So now, Abraham gets down to, oh, if there's ten righteous. And the Lord said, for ten righteous, I'll not destroy the city. But you'll notice, Abraham didn't go down any further than that. Now, if you knew, if you knew that your righteous nephew and his righteous wife and their righteous daughters lived there, I'm not even going to include the sons-in-law. I'll just say Lot and his wife and two daughters. Why didn't Abraham negotiate with the Lord down to four? Because then he'd have been able to say, Well, Lord, my nephew is there and his wife and his daughters. So you can't destroy these cities. No, tell you why. Because people don't live places that they despise. People don't live places that they utterly hate except that they have somehow learned to acclimate to that environment. So to suggest that Lot was this uh, spotless soul who lived amongst a bunch of homosexuals is as dumb as dumb can get. Why on earth would Lot live in a city that was comprised of homosexuals? Why? Where would his daughters find husbands in a city full of homosexuals? Why would his daughters, and why wouldn't they move away from home if this city is comprised primarily of homosexuals? See, there are too many aspects of this story right there. You see what I'm talking about? Just use your head for a minute. Just think for a minute. There are too many aspects of this story already that don't quite make sense. I don't quite understand this. So we learn in Genesis 18 that Sodom and her sister and Gomorrah and their sister cities were already slated for destruction. The reputations had reached heaven, and the Lord Himself was on a mission to confirm whether that reputation was indeed factual. Now, the first three verses, there came two angels 
to Sodom at even. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and he said, Behold, now my lords turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. This was very popular custom in ancient times. People staying in the street, uh, they would go into a fortified city at night. Many of your cities in biblical times uh, would have walls around the city. And what would happen is, as sundown began to break, uh, they would begin to lock the city up. And that was to prevent marauders, that was to prevent uh, land pirates, so to speak, you know, an assault from other nation cities uh, and attacks. So they would, you know, lock up the city. So people who were traveling, what they would do is they would purposely kind of travel from one spot to the next. And as it got near sundown, they knew, well, we better get into this city before sundown because they're going to lock it up. And then what they would do is they would just sleep right there on the street uh, near the gate, but on the inside. Now the Bible here tells us that Lot was in the gate of Sodom. Why in the world would Lot be in the gate? Why is Lot near the gate of Sodom? Well, obviously, this suggests to us that Lot was a lot more active in the life of Sodom than merely one who lived there. No, it was customary at this time for people who actually were involved in government and who were involved in the governance of a city or a community to gather at the gate. This was the gathering place of people who were civic-minded, people who were involved in government and making decisions, and they would debate, and they would talk, and they would argue, and, you know, they would have all their discussions at this location. So the very fact that Sabbath, that a lot is in the gate suggests to us that he actually had a very active life in, in as part of the city of Sodom. He was not just somebody who lived there, but he was actually engaged in the city. Now, being in the gate, he sees these men come in. It's getting towards sundown because, A, that's why these men are coming into the city at this point, is to rest and uh, get ready for the following day to continue their journey, or at least that's the appearance they're trying to give. And Lot immediately goes over to them, and you're going to find out in a little bit, this is what distinguishes Lot from the rest of Sodom. Lot immediately goes over to these men, and he says, gentlemen, y'all are traveling. Why don't you come stay in my house? You can get cleaned up. You can have something to eat. You can get a good night's rest. Then tomorrow you can continue the rest of your journey. Believe it or not, and, you're, and I'm going to show it to you in a little bit, this is what distinguishes Lot. This is where Lot's righteousness is revealed. And when I say righteousness, I mean his willingness and his desire to do right. And they say to him, oh no, we'll be fine. You know, we're, we, we sleep in the street all the time. We've got our blankets. We're ready. You know, we'll just make a little uh, bedding down here and we'll be fine, you know. And, but the word of God said that Lot pressed on them greatly in verse 3. He insisted. He really insisted that they do. Why is this? Why did Lot insist that they do this? Well, I'm going to give you a spoiler instead of dragging it out. He knew what was going to happen that night. And he was trying to protect these men. He knew what, listen to what I just said. He knew what was going to happen and he was trying to protect these men. What happened that night in terms of people coming to Lot's door was not entirely unexpected. 
Lot did not expect that they were necessarily going to come to his door and try to insist that these men participate in their activity. But he did anticipate the activity. Do you follow what I'm saying? And what that activity was, I'm going to explain to you in a little bit, and you'll see. Okay? So as the story starts, the angels have gone from Abraham in Mambre to the gates of Sodom. That is where uh, Lot meets him, invites him to come in, and uh, they go into Lot's house. Now, it was common practice in biblical times for the gates of every great city to be lowered or closed at night to prevent attack during the hours of darkness. It was also the people of, excuse me, the practice of the people of Sodom, mind you I said people, male and female, to engage in some very rough and perverse play once their city was securely shut up. Unfortunately, it wasn't a good idea for travelers to stay in the cities overnight as the city had a reputation of violence and greed amongst other things. So Lot met these strangers at the gate and he uh, involves, he invites them to come into his home. They go in and uh, decide they're going to spend the night with Lot. Lot must have enjoyed living in the city of Sodom. He was very much a part of what went on there. The one thing, however, that set Lot apart from the others uh, that lived there was his deep concern for the welfare of these two strangers. He literally begs these men to come in and stay with he and his family as the streets of Sodom are not, uh, not a safe place for strangers to have to make their beds. Uh, now, verse 4 and 5, but before they lay down, now they're in Lot's house, before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, and again, remember earlier I said, all the people from every quarter, and they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came in, uh, into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. All right. These two verses really are the crux of the entire story. When we read in the English translation that the house was surrounded by men, and it said both old and, excuse me, it said, uh, but they laid down the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. Well, when I first did my study of this passage, I decided I am going to look at the original Hebrew, because twice I'm reading the word men. But then on the third occasion, instead of the word man being used, I'm reading the word people. People and men are not the same. Therefore, if I'm to believe this passage exactly as it reads, then it must be saying that it was males who surrounded Lot's house. Am I telling the truth? That must be what the word men means, right? That the men of Sodom, all the men of Sodom, has to be men. They must be speaking of males, right? However, when you look at the Hebrew, the Hebrew word used twice for men is enosh which is man, mortal man, person, or mankind, an individual. 
It is the collective use of the word men. Just like when you say mankind, you're not speaking of all males, you're speaking of all humanity. So the reality is this passage was literally saying that all the people of Sodom, male and female, from the get-go surrounded Lot's house. That changes everything. All of a sudden the whole story blows up. It's one a bunch of queer men. Switching a bunch of flaming faggots. No, 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 honey. This was the people of Sodom. All the people. And then when you get to uh, the word people, and you go to the original Hebrew text, it literally means nation, people, persons, members of one's people, compatriots or countrymen, kindred. In other words, it is a group of human beings who have something in common. What do they have in common? They're the inhabitants of Sodom. They are the citizens of Sodom. Okay? And so, now, the story has already changed just in understanding one simple word and how it is misunderstood just in a casual reading, okay? So all the people of Sodom, uh, all the people of the city, even the people of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. That is, in effect, how that passage should literally read. Had the use of the term men, again, in King James era, it was common to use that kind of language to even speak of a crowd or a group that consisted of both men and women. It was common to still use the word men. Do you see what I'm saying? But in modern era, in modern times, that is not the case. Now, when we use the word men, we strictly mean males, okay? And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Growing up as a kid, I can't count how many times I heard a preacher talk about how the word know means to have sex with. That means, you know, they wanted to have sex with them. Well, the reality is, in this instance, the word no does, in fact, have a sexual connotation. However, when doing a study of this specific Hebrew word that is used here, you find out that uh, the term that is employed here, no, actually means something a little bit deeper than to simply have sex with. But this, the development of this word came from the idea of ascertaining through vision, ascertaining through seeing. You know somebody, you know, from... You see them, you observe them, you know them, okay? However, this word is a combination of to ascertain through seeing and sexual practice. So, it is literally a word that means to gain some sexual stimulation, listen carefully now, through visual contact. This wasn't necessarily that the people of Sodom were threatening to rape the men of Sodom, and a lot of your LGBT affirming theologians, they, they go there, you know. See, I'm, folks, I'm telling you, I told you, when I came into affirming ministry, 
I did all my own study. I didn't read anything written by anybody. I didn't read a book. I didn't read a pamphlet. I didn't read an article. I went strictly to the Word of God. So what I'm presenting to you is not a thing of the world I've heard from anybody else. This is all stuff that I was able to extrapolate through my own studies, okay? So while there are other LGB theologians who will try to say, well, you know, they were wanting to rape them. To me, they're being still, they're being careless because they're not, they're not really doing the, the work. The reality is they wanted to use these men as sexual stimuli, but through visual contact. And if there's anybody out there who said, well, I don't understand the notion of that. Sure you do. <laughs> sure you do. There are strip clubs all over Dallas, Texas. There are strip clubs all over Huntsville, Alabama. Men go to these clubs, and what's the first rule at the club? You can't touch the women. You don't lay your hands on the women. They're certainly not allowed to have sex with the women. But boy, they'll sit there for hours and hours and hours and, uh, you know, watch um, Married with Children, for instance, you know. And there's old Al Bundy, he'll go to one of these clubs and he'll watch these women for hours. Then he goes home and he's all steamed up and ready to spend some time with his wife. Why? because he just spent time visually being stimulated sexually. So the activity that they were involved in this night was sexual in nature, but they wanted to draw these strangers into their activity, mind you, without their consent. They were not asking these men to participate. They were just wanting to force these men to participate in their activity. And they were wanting to use them as sexual stimuli. So it's likely, of course, that they might have wanted to strip them, you know, and that sort of thing. So the, the interaction was certainly violent. It was uninvited, okay? It was not... And nowhere are they asking these strangers if they want to participate in this thing, okay? So uh, there, there are a lot of elements to this crime, so to speak. But it is being perpetrated by the people of Sodom, not merely by men. This had nothing to do with homosexual men. Now, I'm going to go ahead in the story a little bit just to make this point because it's fitting. Notice the punishment that the angels inflicted upon the men, the people of Sodom, who had come to Lot's door. What is he what is he what did they cause to happen? Did they cause the uh, those coming to Lot's door and, and practically banging it down? Do they cause these people to drop dead? Do they cause, they cause these people's sexual organs to turn to stone and fall off? No. What do they cause? They cause them to go blind. Guess what? Here's another area. Again, this is what I mean about when you understand something in truth. It really is wonderful because all of a sudden it's like, wow, so many things make sense now. If you were wanting to use us, the angels, you might say, are thinking, as visual stimuli for your little sex party, for your little religious orgy, which is what they were doing, and I'll be explaining that in a little bit, we're going to make it so that we would be of no value to you anyway for the exact thing you wanted to use this for. People act like, you know, I've heard it preached. That way they couldn't even find Lot's door. Oh my goodness, how stupid. 
<laughs> How stupid is that? Blind people find doors every day. You know, that, that is idiotic. No, the punishment perfectly fit the crime. They were wanting to use these men as visual sexual stimuli, and the Lord said, nope, I can fix that problem real quick. And boom, they're struck blind. Now they can't become visually stimulated sexually in, in any way, shape, size, or form. It's not possible for them, do you see? So all of a sudden this whole story just changes. All of a sudden you begin to see things making a lot more sense. Why would Lot live in homosexual city? He didn't. <laughs> um, uh, why in the world would Lot offer his daughters to a bunch of homosexuals? He didn't. You know, uh, the, the reality is these people were engaged in a religious orgy. And again, I'll be going into more detail momentarily. This is why Lot tried to present his daughters as virgins. Because within the context of their religion, what was the most valuable commodity in a sexual orgy environment were virgins. So that's why Lot suggested, I have two daughters who have never known men, even though that was a lie. But that he thought that would sweeten the pot, that would sweeten the offer, so to speak. You know, maybe they'll be just as happy with a couple of virgins. He wasn't just throwing that out there like, you know, and, and knowing good and bloody well they weren't going to accept it. No, no. He was literally throwing, out that, uh, throwing that out there with the thought that they may very well be appeased by this. Yeah, a couple of virgins. Woo-hoo, that'll really, you know, spark up the party. So all of a sudden the story begins to make so much more sense when we understand in reality what is being said and the meaning of what is being said. Now, the conduct of the people of Sodom had nothing to do with homosexuality to suggest that gay men are so sexually out of control as to insist that they would go haywire and attempt to rape a stranger just because he is attractive is absolutely contrary to history, it is contrary to fact, and it is contrary to human experience. Curriculum that is used by law enforcement agencies even uh, in Texas, uh, my mother was a police officer, and she told me, she said some of the studies that she had to do as a police officer, she said within their curriculum, it is clearly stated that the majority of sexual crimes, including rape, incest, and child molestation, are committed by heterosexuals. That is a scientific um, statistical fact, folks. The actual percentage of homosexuality, excuse me, of homosexuals committing such crimes falls far below the relative percentages of homosexuals as compared to heterosexuals. Okay, now People who want to purposely misrepresent reality and they want to embrace a lie in order to feed their hatred and they purposely will choose to believe otherwise. They'll just choose to believe otherwise. Has, they don't give a fly about facts. They don't care about statistics. They don't care about science. Boy, we've learned that in the Trump era, haven't we? So they'll believe that foolishness that, you know, gay men, oh, they just got so horned off the left that they were ready to rape these men up baloney. It's not even close to what happened that day. 
Why are gay men not constantly being arrested for raping non-gay men? According to so many preachers I've heard and so-called Christians, uh, gay and lesbian people are incapable of curbing or controlling their sexual appetites. Folks, that's stupid. That is just foolishness. The destruction of Sodom and her sister cities had mainly to do with their rampant idolatry and its association with idolatrous sexual orgies. Idolatrous sexual orgies were very common in ancient times. Most of your ancient religions had a sexual element associated with them. Um, it, it, it was so common, in fact, that when the Lord led the people of Israel out of Egypt and into the land of Canaan, if you remember in the law, and we're going to get into this when we start looking at Deuteronomy and what have you, but the Lord constantly was saying through Moses to the people of Israel, when you get into Canaan, I do not want you to behave as the people of that land behave. And all the thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not that God gave, folks, those things did not come out of the air. God was not just dropping rules out of the sky. No. Every single thing he was saying, he was speaking as a counterbalance to practices that the people in Canaan were already presently practicing. So when the Lord said, thou shalt not, lie with a man is with a woman, for instance, there was a specific act going on in Canaan amongst the people of Canaan that is associated with this description. It's not what you think it is, but we'll get to it in another study. To read the, the, the Levitical law and not understand that And the Lord over and over and over again says, I don't want you doing these things as they do. I don't want you behaving like this as they do. Throughout the whole book of Leviticus, he constantly is speaking these words. And he's making a point. It's kind of like your mother saying to you when you're a kid, all right, now we're going over to your aunt and uncle's house, but I don't want you acting like your cousin's. They may do this, but I don't want you doing that. They may, they may think it's all right to run around the house screaming, but I don't want you running around the house screaming. They may think it's okay to talk back to their parents, but don't you think you're going to talk back to me? They may think it's okay to jump on the bed, but I don't want you to jump on the bed. That is exactly what God was doing in the book of Leviticus. And the reality is... Uh, Many of the pagan religions of ancient times used to involve sexual activities as part of their religious practice. And this is what God deemed, this is what God called um, abomination. He, anything associated with idolatry, God would use the word abomination, okay? It had nothing to do with this is more dirty to me than anything else is. This is more vulgar to me than anything else is. This is more offensive to me than it. No, 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 no. No, that, that was not the context in which the Lord was speaking. But he was literally saying, uh, oftentimes, if not most times, when he would use the word abomination, he was referring to something that was of an idolatrous nature. And it was not the act itself so much as its association with idolatry that offended God. What was the first commandment? I am the Lord that God, and beside me you shall know no other. Then what he said, Thou shalt make unto thee no graven image or any likeness of anything. So 
on his top 10 list of offenses, what's at the top of the list? Idolatry. Okay? So idolatrous conduct and idolatrous behavior was deemed by, deemed by God to be abomination. The activity that is engaged in uh, Sodom, this sexual idolatrous conduct is abomination to God. Do you follow what I'm saying? Okay? If you look at the book of Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 6, oh, wait a minute, no, 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 that's the wrong, I don't know why I pulled that up. <laughs> I was trying to get some scriptures earlier ready, and I pulled up the wrong one, sorry about that. Um, I knew the minute I read the word Proverbs, I was like, no, 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 that, that isn't right. Anyway, sorry about that. Give me one second here. <sighs> I tried to have all this ready. We had to switch our, our um, laptops out real quick. That one for this one and this one for that one. And unfortunately... Uh, I, at the last minute, I was trying to get everything set up, and I had the wrong, had the wrong passage set up. But anyway, now in the Word of God, we are specifically told what the sins of Sodom were. And I mean, without any guesswork, without any. Let me see here a minute. Hold on a second. I don't know why this isn't. It's Ezekiel chapter 16, actually. In Ezekiel chapter 16, the Lord speaks through the prophet Ezekiel. And he explains exactly what the sins of Sodom were. And in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 48, he says, As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters, as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Behold, verse 49, Ezekiel 16, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. And now he gives us a list. These are the exact sins that he destroyed Sodom for. Listen. Pride. Fullness of bread. And abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination. This is religious idolatrous practice. Committed abomination. Idolatrous practice. Before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw good. So see, folks, you're running around letting people condemn you. You're feeling bad. You're feeling condemned. You know, you're feeling so terrible because people use the story of Sodom against you. And yet the reality is God himself, through the prophet, God himself, you, you got to remember this. I'm, this isn't Ezekiel just writing his own words. No, he's prophesying. We just did a study on the gifts of the Spirit. We just talked about prophecy. Ezekiel is literally speaking the words that God has placed in his mouth to speak. He's speaking in the first person. 
Therefore, I did away with Ezekiel, but didn't do away with Sodom and Gomorrah. No, God did. So God himself is articulating what the sins of Sodom were. And he starts at the top of the list is pride. Fullness of bread, meaning they were gluttonous. He talks about the fact that uh, they did not take care of the poor and the needy. Okay? These are things that are very important to the Lord. They're not very important to the Republican Party. They're not very important to many uh, uh, Christians in the world, or so-called Christians in the world today. But they're very important to the Lord. And so if, if we allow ourselves to understand the truth about these stories and about these issues, I'm going to tell you it's going to take a huge weight off of your shoulders. And you are going to feel so relieved and you will feel rightfully that you have every right to walk into a church and worship God and serve God as anybody else does. Now, I want to just read to you real quickly. I was talking earlier, um, uh, uh, in this, in this, and then I'm going to finish for today. I was talking earlier about how studying Hebrew, you know, through a translation and stuff, is really, uh, you're not going to glean from it what you ought to glean from it. Let me read to you some comments made by uh, some ancient rabbis and famous uh, Jewish leaders, uh, some of the great minds of Judaism. Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch, he lived 1808 to 1888, and he wrote, Our sacred literature does not use obscure language, but describes most things in words clearly indicating their meaning. Therefore, it is necessary at all times to delve into the literal meaning of words to achieve complete understanding of what is actually meant. Uh, Hakim Nakam Balik, a Jewish poet who lived 1873 to 1934, wrote, Reading the Bible in translation is like kissing your new bride through a veil. <laughs> uh, Benjamin Lee Worf, a Hebrew linguist who lived uh, 1897 to 1941, he said, language shapes the way we think and determines what we can think about. Thomas Paine, you know that name. He was an author, 1737 to 1809. The Bible is a book that has been read more and examined less than any book that has ever existed. And boy, that's the truth. Okay, I hope this initial study has at least put a little bit of a spark in you uh, to hear the rest, okay? We're going to get into the passages in Leviticus. We're going to do a, a very careful examination of Romans chapter 1, some of the other, what we commonly refer to as common passages, uh, clobber passages. But I hope tonight that this study has at least stirred your interest and made you a little more excited about hearing what else we're going to have to say in future studies. I hope it's enlightened you, encouraged you, inspired you. If you have any feedback, please give it. Uh, leave your feedback on Facebook or on YouTube. We love to see positive feedback. Anything that is nasty or negative, I'll tell you right now, I'm going to delete it. So don't waste your breath because it won't be on there for more than a minute. Uh, but if you have anything you'd like to say uh, of, a, of a good and, and constructive nature, we would love to hear it, okay? Um, 
Let's go to the Lord and close tonight. I, I said we're going to try to close our Bible studies in the neighborhood of 830, and I don't want to break that. Uh, I could go longer, of course, but I don't want to. I want to try to stay within that framework. So let's go to the Lord in prayer once again. Father, once again, God, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you, Lord, for the desire and the willingness to examine more carefully your sacred and divine text. Lord, you say things for our benefit. You say things for our good. You have provided the means of salvation for lost humanity. And Master, today it is so imperative that we understand in truth what the Word of God teaches and what the Word of the Lord says. We thank you, Master, tonight for a clearer understanding. I ask God that you would help us to think about those things which we've heard tonight. Help us, Lord, uh, to think more critically when we read the Word of God in translation, uh, not so that we might disbelieve it or discount it, but rather, Lord, so that we might understand the need to dig a little deeper sometimes and to do our research so that we might understand it more fully and understand it best. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for being with us. We thank you for the joy of the Lord, which is our strength, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. Go with us from this place, O God. Forever keep us under your mighty hand. We ask it all today in none other than Jesus' wonderful, precious name. Amen. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed tonight's start to our series. Uh, and I hope you'll be with us on Sunday at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time for a celebration of life in Christ. If you live in the Huntsville, Alabama area, we desperately need you to come to church. We need some folks to come help us to do what we're trying to do. Okay, we're trying to do something historic. We are trying to do something powerful. We can create a movement in this city that will have such a positive impact on not only on the city of Huntsville and in the state of Alabama, but on our nation and in our world. But we need folks to come help us. And then also, of course, next Wednesday at 7 o'clock, Again, Central Standard Time. I hope you'll join us for our midweek Bible study. In the meantime, as always, God bless you. In Jesus' name is our sincere prayer.